Once electricity has been generated, it needs to get to places to get used. The transmission of electrical energy has followed an interesting path from low voltage local DC to high voltage long distance AC to high voltage long distance DC and back to low voltage local DC. Quite a journey. Here are the details. In September 1882, Thomas Edison's Pearl Street Station began supplying 400 volt DC power to electric light customers in Lower Manhattan, one of the first of its kind. It used coal-fired boilers to supply steam to reciprocating steam engines driving Edison's dynamos, large DC generators. Distribution was to a limited area as the energy was delivered at the same voltage it was generated. You see, power in an electrical circuit comes from a combination of the electrical pressure, voltage, and the flow of electrical energy, current. The two are multiplied together to get watts, the measure of power consumption. So you can have any combination of the two, as long as the energy needs of the customer is satisfied. Different combinations carry different consequences, however. Let's say customers need a total of 5,000 watts of power per hour, 5 kilowatts we'd call it. You could deliver it by transmitting 5,000 volts at 1 amp. With a small current flow like that, the wires wouldn't get very hot, so there wouldn't be much heat loss. Unfortunately, 5,000 volts is a lot of electrical pressure and would make connecting and disconnecting devices a real adventure with the possibility of short circuits, fires, and personal injury. Or you could lower the voltage so it was safer, but then you'd have to increase current flow to deliver the same number of watts. However, higher current flow heats up the wires, and that heat is lost energy. Edison's choice was to set the voltage at 400 and live with the high current flow. His plan was to have many local generating plants so there could be short runs of cable. That way the heat losses wouldn't be too high. It meant he had to use pretty thick cable though and that was expensive. Also, a sooty coal burning power plant every few blocks did not seem like a good idea to the city fathers and citizens even in the 1880s. What was needed was an easy way to change the ratio of volts to amps so power could be moved long distances at high voltage and low current and then step down in voltage for local distribution. In Edison's time, there was no economical and efficient way to do this with DC power. The alternative was to use an alternating current system. With alternating currents moving magnetic field, energy could be transferred and voltage varied by using a newly developed device, a transformer. George Westinghouse bought some European patents and hired William Stanley to further develop the concept. A typical transformer uses two sets of wires wrapped around a common core. The primary side of the transformer is connected to the source of voltage and has a rising and falling magnetic field around it as the current goes through the AC sine wave. The magnetic lines of force move through the windings on the secondary side of the transformer and induce voltage there. The amount of induced voltage depends on the ratio of wire lengths or wrap turns of wire between the two sides. If the secondary side has more turns of wire, the voltage is higher. If it has less, the voltage is lower in exact ratio. 
Once these devices were developed, it ushered in the age of AC power. Power could be generated at remote locations, hydro resources or large fossil fuel plants, raised to high voltage for transmission with minimal loss, then lowered for safe distribution. Here's an interior view of one of the first hydroelectric plants built using AC generators at Niagara Falls, New York. Power generated here was transmitted to Buffalo via 11,000 volt lines. High voltage AC lines now crisscross the U.S. at several hundred thousand volts and the rest of the world, transmitting power hundreds or even thousands of miles in some cases. The moving magnetic field that made it all possible doesn't come without cost, however. Two AC effects cause most of the trouble. The first comes directly from the moving field. You see, when the field rises and falls around a current carrying conductor, it doesn't just cut through an adjacent conductor, it cuts through itself. And what happens when there's relative motion between a conductor and a magnetic field? That's right, a voltage is induced. In this case, the voltage is induced in a conductor that already has voltage applied to it by another source. But that doesn't stop it from happening. The induced voltage causes current to flow in the conductor, current separate from the current flowing to the load by the action of the source voltage. The new current opposes the originating current. This effect is called inductive reactance. So now, part of the energy supplied to the circuit is taken to build the magnetic field and then added back when the field collapses but it's added back in opposition to the applied current. It causes resistance and heating in the circuit. The effect is intensified as current flow increases, frequency increases, or if the conductor is coiled. There are millions of feet of coiled wire out there. Every transformer, every motor, every coil of any kind, all little inductive current generators. As inductive load grows, it actually affects the relationship of voltage and current in the system. The opposing current slows down the change in current direction demanded by the system's voltage sources. The perfectly synced sine wave that occurs when there's only straight resistance in a circuit loses that symmetry when inductance happens. The current wave falls behind the voltage wave. We say that under the influence of inductance, the change in current lags the change in voltage. As the lag increases, a greater and greater percentage of the current in the lines is the opposing or reactive current. Every line has a limit of current flow. As inductance increases, the line's capacity for watts, real power, declines. The resistance increase caused by the reactive current flow also does what every other form of resistance does, causes a voltage drop. So, as system current demand increases, inductance increases, limiting the line capacity right when more capacity is needed, plus voltage drops at an increasing rate as flow goes up. Not a formula for maximum reliability. Many problems have been caused in electric systems by inductance over the years, particularly on hot summer days with high loads and heavy current flows. The second problem with AC transmission is the so-called capacitive effect. When a long transmission line is lightly loaded, current flow and therefore inductive effects are low. However, the lines are still being charged and discharged at 60 cycles, and they act like a giant capacitor. Positives and negative charges separated by a dielectric, the air. The capacitive effect causes a rise in voltage from the source end of the line toward the load. The voltage rise can approach 10% in some cases, and may require action on the part of generator operators 
to avoid exceeding excitation and voltage limits. Capacitive voltage rise in transmission line is, is called the Ferranti effect after the English engineer who first described it in a transmission system of his design in 1887. The capacitive effect is just the opposite of inductance and is actually used to counter inductance in many circumstances. The point is, these two effects complicate the operation of the transmission system, but they only exist in AC circuits. So why don't we transmit power with DC? Well, we do, now. Remember, initially there was no good way to change the voltage and current ratio with DC. Solid state electronics solved that one for us. The development of high voltage rated transistors and special varieties of thyristors, electronic on and off switches, have made high voltage DC systems economical. They have extended the use of high voltage DC down to blocks as small as a few tens of megawatts and lines as short as a few dozen miles of overhead line. Of course, long distance high voltage DC transmission has been used for many years because it generally has lower overall investment cost and lower losses than an equivalent AC transmission system. HVDC requires less conductor per unit distance than an AC line as there is no need to support three phases and other effects are minimized. There's no inductive or capacitive effect with DC, so those losses are eliminated. But equipment still has to be located at both ends of the line to do the AC-DC conversion. Currently, HVDC lines are used to transfer power underwater and for long distance. They are also used to connect separate AC networks. So now, we have a kind of hybrid system, one built with AC, but with DC transmission grafted onto it because technologies were developed that made DC economical in some cases. Okay, let's see where we are. We started with locally distributed DC, but that was not a viable solution because it couldn't be economically transmitted long distance and local generation was problematic. AC took over because it could be easily transformed, but the same property that made that possible also caused other problems. Meanwhile, DC's transformation issues were solved, but with an AC system already in place, DC was a solution looking for a problem. Some uses were found, but not on a large scale. Concurrently, advances in solar cell technology have made solar cells a competitive source of electrical power. But guess what? Solar cells generate in DC, so for it to be used, it has to be converted to AC because that's the system we have. Even more ridiculous, Many modern bits of technology, computers, notepads, LED lights, and other small appliances, require DC, leading to the multiple AC-DC converters you have around your house. So, follow me here. It is entirely possible, actually quite common, to generate electricity in DC, convert it to AC, transmit it some distance through the AC system, convert it to DC for long distance transmission, back into AC for local distribution, and then back into DC to power your computer. So that's DC to AC to DC to AC to DC. Four conversion steps with loss at each one. Doesn't sound real efficient to me. How about you? Some brave souls are trying to live in a DC world, but it's not easy right now. Using solar cells and battery banks, it's possible to live off the grid, that is, supplying all your own power. But to make AC appliances work, inverters have to be used to convert the low voltage DC power to standard AC levels, 120 or 240 volts. Why can't we move to a completely DC system? 
Well, there are several issues. The first comes from the complete lack of voltage standardization in DC devices. Where most AC devices are either 120 or 240 volts, DC is all over the map, 1, 2, 3, 5, 10, 12, 15, 18, and so on, with multiple variations. And, as you no doubt noticed, those were primarily low voltages, because most current DC devices were designed to operate off batteries. What we need are DC devices that use similar voltage to AC, 125 or 240. Why? Because the higher voltage means lower current flow, and so smaller wires and less heat loss. Your 1200 watt hair dryer, running on 12 volts, would draw 100 amps of current. That's about what an entire typical house draws with AC at 120 volts. Another problem occurs when we want to shut off a DC circuit. For low power devices, it's no problem. And here's what happens when we break a 220 volt AC circuit under load. Not much. Remember, an AC circuit drops to zero twice every cycle. Different story with DC. It's always at the rated voltage and current flow. No handy zero crossing point to break the arc. This is a 220 volt DC circuit. Imagine what a 100,000 volt circuit or higher would look like. Progress is being made in this area. There are low voltage DC breakers available, but they're more expensive than equivalent AC units. High voltage DC breakers, suitable for use in the transmission system, are being developed. The technology is available, but it will take a while before the costs come down to the point where they are commonly used. Meanwhile, we're stuck with this hybrid system. Personally, I believe DC will slowly creep into existing systems and will gradually move to DC. Maybe Edison will be proven right after all. That was a look at how we transmit electrical energy. I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to my YouTube channel to see other videos in the series. Thanks for watching.